It's sad enough that our young men are being killed. But when our women are not safe, as men in our community, we are called to stand up and protect the women in our community. Right. And when our women are not safe, then it's going to get to a point that we can no longer be passive. At some point, we have to fight aggression with aggression. Mm -hmm. As pastors and Christians, yes, right we're right called right to love. Right we're right called right. to forgive. But we're not, we're not called to be fools. James Farr here, live from Pasadena Media Studios. Get ready for more piercing and provocative. The Conversation Live starts now. Welcome to another episode of The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. Coming up today on The Conversation Live, we're going to have a critical and possibly uncomfortable conversation. I want to talk about the recent shooting in Dallas-Fort Worth of our dear sister, Atiana Jefferson, by a police officer now charged. Also, we want to explore some solutions to ending gang violence and senseless violence in our community. Also, here in the seat today is the minister, Tony Mohammed of the Nation of Islam. He is the Western Regional Representative, as well as Michelle White, who is the founder of Servant Neighborhoods. And she's going to talk about the upcoming Peace Ride, Peace Walk. But first, let's take a look at this first clip, and then we'll welcome our guest in on the other side. Well, now to the outrage and the search for answers after a white police officer shot and killed a black woman in her own home through her bedroom window. ABC's Marcus Moore has the story. Jefferson. Jefferson. Overnight, protesters flooding the streets. No justice, no peace! We're tired of this injustice. Anger rising following the shooting death of 28-year-old Atatiana Jefferson, killed in her home by a Fort Worth police officer. Uh, I'm calling about my neighbor. The incident sparked by a phone call made by a concerned neighbor. In the newly released audio, a Tatiana's neighbor tells police he noticed her front door was open around 2.24 in the morning and called a police non-emergency line to ask for a welfare check. I haven't seen anybody moving around. It's not normal for them to have both of the doors open this time. I'm not the neighbor unsure of whether a Tatiana was home at the time. You know if anyone is inside? No, I'm not sure. Both of the calls are there. The dispatcher immediately sent officers to her home. This body cam video shows the moment the encounter turns deadly. The responding officer is not heard identifying himself as he approaches Jefferson's bedroom window and begins shouting commands. Put your hands up, show me your hands. Within moments, he fires one deadly shot through the window. And welcome back. Man, every time I've watched it, it, it I still feel a certain kind of way. But at any rate, Minister Muhammad, mm -hmm. Sister White, thank you so much for being here in the seat. Minister Muhammad, what's your reaction to this? I mean, because you've seen a lot of things in, 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 in your ministry and your work that you've done in the communities and streets. Um, but what's your reaction when you see something like this? Well, on one hand, it just shows that there are different types of policing that's going on based on your ethnic makeup. If this call had to come from a white neighbor, or an Asian neighbor, you would have saw a different result. How so? What do you, you mean know? by what do you mean by that? In that, you know, you the officer, his mindset. You know, if you go into an area that's predominantly black, you already come in there with a bias. You come in there with a perception that something has to be wrong. You know, for somebody to get a non-emergency call mm -hmm. to just come and check on a neighbor. You know, and that for that neighbor to be dead, mm -hmm. totally senseless. So my question is, what was in the mind of that officer who approached this scene? Mm -hmm. See? I mean, because for so many who, who may be listening today and watching today, they may not understand why African Americans are so apprehensive about calling law enforcement. Is this one of the reasons why they don't do it? Well, absolutely, because we've had a bad experience with law enforcement from the time we landed on these shores, mm -hmm. you know, from the plantation, from the overseer who became now the police. And so therefore, the police uniform to the black community is what the swastika is to the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. If you bring a German soldier to any Jewish community, you re-stimulate the pain of their past. Mm -hmm. And so the blue uniform is not the human being in it. Sure. 
And so there are certain biases. I've been through some of the training. Mm -hmm. I watch how the police officers act in Hollywood, but I also watch how they act in South Central. Mm -hmm. Totally different. Absolutely. That's the problem. You know, I what happened yesterday, and I don't think I've seen this in my 46 years, where a mayor, city manager, and a police chief actually use the words, I'm sorry, and I apologize. Um, I don't think that that makes the death of this sister any easier on that family, but I'm wondering, is this their attempt to kind of quell kind of what may be rising up from people within that community who are, because we're just coming off the last shooting in Dallas, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so, um, but, you know, let me, let me check in real quick. You're watching The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. My guest today is Minister Tony Muhammad, as well as uh, Michelle White. And we're here for a very specific reason to talk about something that's going to be happening in our community here. It's a peace ride and, and peace walk. Uh, we want to explore some solutions to end some gang violence and you know, gang violence can happen to anybody in anywhere. So let's take a look at some families that have had some experience uh, with it. Jerry, go ahead and, and roll in both uh, segments of three, video one and two, please. Thanks. Impacted me in more ways to where last year I ended up losing my son, you know, and, and it was something that I could have never, ever, ever, ever foreseen. Like, my kid? Like, nah. My own son, Brandon Douglas, um, he was murdered December 22nd, 2017, here in Pasadena due to gang. Christopher, I'll never stop loving you. And his life really began to take a different tack. And he wanted to come, come back to California because he missed family. And so in 2013, Christopher came back to California. Uh, he got a job working downtown and uh, he worked three blocks from me. And so he would ride to work with me every day. He would get up at um, 4.45 every morning. He lived in Duarte, and he would drive from Duarte to our house and park the car right out there. And he'd get here at 10 minutes to six, and he'd be ready to go. There's nothing like, you know, seeing the sun come up in the morning, driving down the freeway with your kid in the car, and you're on your way to work. And he felt like his life had gotten on such a track you know, that the gang life was, was no longer a problem for him. We really thought he was out of it. We thought he was safe. And he came and told me um, he was going to pick his daughter up from school and that he would see me tomorrow. And I said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. And welcome back, Michelle. I don't want to talk about your day job. I just want to talk about uh, what, what you do and, and why you're doing it. But, I mean, when you see these families, I mean, you, 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 you were saying earlier how much you love young people and juveniles and, you know, from your work that you do now. When you see this, I mean, does it affect you in some way? And is, is this kind of like the catalyst as to why you wanted to organize this peace ride? Yeah, peace for walk? sure, especially with the first, um, the family is familiar with my sons. I have two sons that play football here in the city that are 27 and 26. So a lot of stuff that goes on now affects me in a whole lot of different ways. I mean, they were, I was a football president here. I was a baseball president here. So I'm seeing the kids in the community that were spending the night at my house now losing their life and then knowing the moms that are lost and left here behind. Minister, I mean, because like I said, you, you talked earlier, you, you, you've been in communities, in neighborhoods, mm -hmm. when, when guys are getting ready to go get about that action, right? Mm -hmm. um, why does this keep happening? I mean, talk to me like I am just completely naive. I, get you. I don't understand. Like, why do we keep in this perpetual cycle of gang right. violence? Well, to me, there's two things happening here. And being a minister and a spiritual man, number one is I use the scripture that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Then on the other end, there's a society that's socially engineering this. There's an unseen hand here. Mm -hmm. There's big business going on as a result of the mayhem that's in our community. So I don't see a criminal when I go into the hoods. I don't see a gangbanger, I see a god. So I don't speak to his condition, I speak to his spirit, I speak to his soul. Mm -hmm. And when you just start telling this brother who he really is beyond who he has said he is, mm -hmm. it kind of jogs him a little bit. 
and then you let him know the struggle of his people. It kind of jogs him a little bit, but the first thing the streets got to know is that you serious, that you are sincere. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a difference, dear brother. So our community is destroyed for the lack of knowledge. You yeah, know? Because it seems like uh, ever since the untimely murder of uh, our dear brother Nipsey Hussle, mm -hmm. um, and I, I were in doing some research, I'll be honest, I didn't know who Nipsey Hussle was. I heard the name and thought, uh, Nipsey Russell, right? Right, <laughs> right? I was a little confused. I'm, I'm dating yeah. myself a little bit. <laughs> but in, in doing some of that research, I came across an interview where he said he, he was going to put in some work. And then he realized where he was going, who he was going to work on, if mm -hmm. you will. Absolutely. And that they looked just like him. Right. Are brothers starting to kind of make that connection? Because you've talked earlier about how, you know, there have been truths in L.A., mm -hmm. and that's something that we want here in Pasadena. But how is that coming together? Because and, and, mm -hmm. and, I know when he passed, there was a procession. There was, you know, you talked about the police chief as well as the mayor of Los Angeles calling you back in mm -hmm. to restore order. Right. How is that truce working? Well, number one, Nipsey Hussle is the main part of it. This young brother, I was mentoring Nipsey, and we was on the phone all the time. And Nipsey Hussle, two weeks before he was murdered, had gotten on a bus by himself with as much of his jewelry that he could put on. And he went to 26 different neighborhoods to offer his life. Mm -hmm. And not one took his life because they say, we like your music. Mm -hmm because Nipsey's music was beginning to cross over from banging to taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was doing it himself. So he was rapping about what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And so Nipsey helped the seeds that had been planted for years. We've been working in this, uniting the streets for 25 years. The seeds were already planted and Nipsey's language and Nipsey's music was like water to the seed that helped it germinate. Mm -hmm. And when one of his own took his life, all of the hoods that he went to to give his life, I believe that Nipsey Hussle was sent by God and he's the wind of change now because we've seen something phenomenal happen after he was murdered. Two of the most notorious gang wars, the A-Trade gangsters and the rolling 60s came together in the parking lot mm -hmm. in Nipsey's name to stop a 30-year beef. M women who had lost their sons to gang violence fell to their knees crying and then subsequently nearly a, a hundred other hoods came together all dropping their rags at the scene of Nipsey Hussle. Un Precedent. Well, you know, I think what was so prophetic about one of his songs on Victory Lap, uh, Double Up, and the rapper Dom Kennedy yes. on, on his verse says, it's kind of hard to be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. And in some kind of twisted way, what you're saying mm -hmm. is Nipsey was being absolutely what he wanted others to see. Mm -hmm. and, it, and he almost had to become a martyr for others to kind of... Sometimes that happens. Same thing that happened to Malcolm, the same thing that happened to Martin Luther King. You know, you get to see the value of a person when he give his life to what he stood for. Mm -hmm. Nipsey Hussle was working against gentrification. What people don't know, Nipsey Hussle have a 500 million to a billion dollar redevelopment project going on right in South Central. Even though he's dead, he wanted to hire his homies. He wanted to give them jobs because he said, I can't put everybody down on this rap game. Right. And so he was being about what he was rapping about and he was as gangster with that as he was banging. Mm. Let me check in, because I want to get to Michelle and why we all end <laughs> up at this table today. You're watching The Conversation Live. Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. Got to push through this, because we're running short on time. Jared, let's go ahead and cue up uh, this next segment, and we're going to talk about this uh, ride, and I want to ask Michelle why she decided to put it together. Roll it in, Jared. Hundreds of motorcycles and cars participated in the 10th United in Peace ride. Quite a sight this afternoon at Magic Johnson Park in Willowbrook. About 1,000 motorcyclists took part in the event. United in Peace is a multi-ethnic, multi-faith movement aimed at lowering crime in the inner city. The group has been staging monthly peace rides in urban neighborhoods since last October.
Patrick was a good kid. He went to church every day. I lost two sons in 60 days. We're, we're outside, and then out of nowhere, you hear shooting on the other side or on that side. So then I just have to get all the little kids inside. Because when the truth be told, the same brother you shooting at over there, your mama might be going to church with that girl, with that young man's mama. That's right. That's right. You know, That's your daddy, your daddy working with that same kid's daddy at the plant, hope he don't get fired, but you trying to kill him over some red and blue. The <laughs> there was something that happened uh, here on set that, that caught our attention. <laughs> and only the three of us will have that as an inside That's joke. Right. But, uh, but well, with all seriousness, Michelle, this was the genesis. This was kind of what you saw. Why did you want to bring this to, to, to Pasadena? And Jared, if you can pull up the flyer so people can get more information, but why did you want to bring this here? Well, if you just look at it, it's huge. It's, it's, it's a movement, and it's so um, what's needed here and uh, what I think our younger generation needs to see and start with the, the new movement. Um, I'm super passionate about the youth here in our community. Um, and I just, I just love that area. So I think that you bring the two things together, especially with motorcycles and so low take, take, take me through the day. So what happens? So it, it starts in the morning. There's going to be a ride out from, from L.A. or from different areas. Let's walk just us through walk it real through quick. It. Okay, so yeah. 1030 on uh, the 27th, we'd like all the kids of Pasadena to come together and let's, we're going to empower them and um, empower them to understand how they create peace in Pasadena by going back into their schools, their communities, et cetera. Um, they will walk from 11, uh, 11.30 to 12.15 and they'll end up in the front of City Hall and I have a whole rally that's just geared towards empowerment for children. Simultaneously, um, our United in Peace from L.A. will ride from L.A. into Pasadena. We'll be down at the Rose Bowl and then together we're going to pray for the young man that lost his life uh, down at the Rose Bowl. His father is a uh, rider in the United in Peace and been fighting for peace in L.A. and unfortunately now he's a victim of a loss of his son. So we're gonna um, memorialize him and pray for their family and build them up. Then we're gonna take a ride through the Northwest with motorcycles, low riders, and then we'll get to the front of City Hall somewhere between 2.30, 2.45, and from 2.45 all the way to six, we're just gonna empower our community. We would love for any family member that has lost a loved one in the city of Pasadena, we want you to come and just let us love on you and pray for you, give you resources. There's a ton of moms that want that are out there for you. There's a ton of faith based that out there that just want to wrap our hands around. When you say resources, what kind of resources? Do you so we have tons of. I have 50, 25 vendors. So we're looking somewhere at the top of like peace over violence, um, domestic violence, all the way down to housing, jobs, mental illness. Um, LGBTQ, I mean, it's a big wide variety of what represents Pasadena and what we feel um, we can offer resources to. Now, Minister, you, you started this a decade or so ago, right? Yes. And, and it just, you know, I understand it was something that the Minister, uh, Honorable uh, Farrakhan asked you to go out and, and start. Mm -hmm. How did this all kind of come together? I mean, because I, 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 I learned today because I don't ride nothing. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, that the Harleys, the Hogs don't ride with the sports, the bikes. sports bikes. So you had some yeah. issues kind of even in that space and you had to learn to ride a bike as well. Yes. How did it all come together? Well, it came together actually 25 years ago, Minister Farrakhan said, brother, I'm sending you to Los Angeles. He said, this is the best generation we've ever produced. They just don't have no guidance. And whoever is going to guide them is going to have to be for real about what they do. So I'm going to send one of my best ministers to my worst places. Mm -hmm. So he said, win the streets. Get up next to the brother. Don't want nothing from him but to get to know him. So for 10 years, we brought together various street organizations, I don't call them gangs, we call them street organizations. And I won their trust, mm -hmm. all the way down to myself being brutally beaten by the LAPD at a prayer vigil. So when I almost lost my lives trying to save a life, that resonated throughout the streets. So I have a pass to go to any hood I want and I could at least get the ears of the brothers. So we wanted a movement. One day, a mother lost two sons in one day. And that mother's cry did something to my soul. Mm -hmm. When she cried and she said, Minister, please stop this. Do something about it. 
And I promised her that her sons did not die in vain. And from that day, we would start a movement. Because every 30 years, there's a movement in the black community in America. So we're on the heels of another movement. And now we need peace among ourselves. So when I saw the bikers, and I saw that on those bikes are Bloods, Crips, SAs, but that bike bring them together. I looked at the lowriders. I'm like, Blood, Crips, Brown Brothers, but they in those cars riding together. So I said, if I could bring those two together to ride for peace while we walk, but the only way I could do it is that the bikers, I had to promise them I'd never ridden a motorcycle in my life. Okay. At that time, I was 55 years old. I'm in my 60s now. So I went and learned how to ride a Harley and a sports bike in one week. This went through the biking world. Mm -hmm. And from that point, I asked them, the Harleys and the sports bikers, ride together. And they said, only for the peace ride. But after this, we ain't <laughs> riding with them. <laughs> but so I'm, I'm saying, so when the streets saw a Harley, because mm -hmm. the streets know the culture, mm -hmm. when they saw a Harley and a sports bike and Minister Tony out front, the gangbangers couldn't believe it, like, whoa. And we riding through, throwing up the peace sign. Guess what the gang members did? They threw up the peace sign. Now you talked about the 30 year cycle of movements. Yeah. And, and in the fragility of what the space that you occupy, you know, we're, it's an incident away from becoming no longer a movement, but a monument. How That's do we right. keep this momentum going? What's, well, been, what's, what's keeping these brothers from, you know, putting down weapons and, and, and killing one another? Because now, we're creating a venue where they can come together. Because in one of the holy writings of the Holy Quran, it says, I have made you into tribes and families that you may know one another. What we're realizing is that the gang members, some of them are relatives and don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're creating the space. The beauty is the black gangs and the brown gangs trust the nation of Islam. People can say what they want to say about us, but we are trusted. So instead of having the police there to uh, managing the situation, it's us there. And when the homies are getting to know each other, we're riding, they're listening to music. And we've seen more settling of gang uh, disputes at the peace ride than any other venue we've ever had. And it's all because somebody is showing them that we care. And this is what they said. Mm -hmm. They said, this is the first time we ever seen this many people come into our hood mm -hmm. to show that you care. And that's what, that's the impetus that have started this movement. And now the gang members themselves have decided we want this. Well, and Michelle, you know, Pasadena and Altadena, you know, really could be one. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like For sure. uh, Hawthorne and Carson. Yes. Right? They're really they're next door neighbors. And the communities are small, so you'll have some that may affiliate with one, mm -hmm. but their cousins are down the street. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then another. When, you got, when you're out there doing your work and your day job, how is that impacting you? Well, just being on both sides, but I think we run into both of those, and we don't, I don't, we don't treat them any different. So even all the um, empowerment work that I'm doing in the community from my nonprofit side, there, it's not um, I'm only going to work in Pasadena or in Altadena. I'm going to work in the community period, and we look at both of those as communities. You believe the minister's uh, solution will work here in Pasadena? Oh, definitely. Just the things Why? he told us today, just because it's, it's, he didn't give us a hard task. He just made us realize we already are doing the work. We just have to be more present mm -hmm. and get on and we have to be out. We all have to be together and we have to be out on the ground. We can't be inside trying to work on our computer trying to figure it out. We got to be out there with the people. So. All right, well, we're getting hard up on time. Again, you're watching The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, uh, restorative justice. Uh, inclusion and equality. Uh, before we get ready to get out of here again, I got to thank both you guys for uh, oh, thank well, thank you you. taking time out of your schedules. And uh, so may, may I? Yes, sir. I just want to say that what Michelle is doing and what we've done, dear brother, too. We've torn down walls. We're watching. The police wasn't with this at first, mm -hmm. but now the police officers of buying low riders. We have police officers <laughs> who joined the Carvette Club. You have gang members who had never touched a police officer in a friendly way. We had one peace ride where the police had to walk away crying 
because a perception that they had of our community was changed on that day. That he didn't believe that we ever wanted to do nothing but kill each other. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about white officers, mm -hmm. brown officers, black police officers. I had a problem with police. That's torn down now as a result of this peace ride. Mm -hmm. Because it's all of us working together in the worst part of the community. And I say to white people that if you don't help us to restore South Central or Pasadena, you can't move this problem around because now your children are influenced by what happens with the rappers, with the streets. So if we don't solve this, it'll be coming to your neighborhood soon. I'm gonna park it right there. Jerry, <laughs> roll in uh, segment six, and then we'll get out of here on the other side. We are here to dedicate this time and moment to our great prince, a general, let us stop all gang wars. Let us stop all black on black crime, brown on brown crime. This is the first time in the history of Los Angeles that we have stood up when a black man kill another black man. We are saying that crap is done. We will try to unite all the tribes so that we can finish out his legacy. We believe in freedom. We believe in equality of opportunity. We believe in justice. We want that justice apply equally to all, regardless to creed, class, or color. And we're back. <laughs> Till we have another opportunity to speak with you, uh, as always, agape. Thank y'all so much. No. Thank you. It's awesome. So engaging. The Conversation Live is brought to you by...